So we've got about 20, 20, 25 minutes to take some questions from the floor. And I'll interject with questions from Twitter as they come through. Um, anybody from the floor? Let's start over here, and I'll let you. I'll let you. Are you I'll it. let you call on them. Okay. How much? <laughs> um, do you want to come up to the microphone? <laughs> I just wanted to ask about um, Vancouver. Is very uh, has a high percentage of uh, immigrants, and sometimes there's a big cultural barrier that I've seen. Uh, for many reasons, so I was just wanted to ask how would you address that so it, w it doesn't become like the car, the immediate possibility, but cycling and walking be kind of a, your transportation way of, of doing it. This problem comes up in the Netherlands. It's a very important problem in the Netherlands because they have a large Indonesian population. And in Indonesia, women don't generally cycle. And so they have special programs to encourage Indonesian, well, Indonesian immigrants, women, to get on bikes in the Netherlands. They actually have, so they have a special supportive program to get around this cultural barrier. I don't know all the details about it, but it does take a special effort. There's no question about it. But I can't tell you more details than that. <laughs> Thank you for the talk, that was great. Um, I'm just wondering what you see as some of the challenges and barriers of the, the topics that you addressed here and applying them to rural and small communities and how you would suggest overcoming them. I think in rural communities, it's, it's probably very difficult because things are so far away from each other. But in smaller communities, it may even be easier. In fact, the, the, the examples I gave up here of uh, uh, Yukon and, and Northern Territories, I mean, the, the fact that they are small communities mean trip distances are, are less. And so it's much easier to cover it by bike. It also means in a small community, there's less traffic probably. You don't have huge amounts of, of traffic. And so for a small community, I think, uh, call it a, I'm not sure, a small community, um, that the cycling is every bit as feasible as it would be in a big city for different reasons. There are different challenges. But I think if it's a small community, that the, there are many trips, not every trip, but maybe the shopping trip, maybe the trip to visit your friends or the trip to whatever, do some small shopping, that that could be done even more easily by bike than in a big city. And the problem with cycling in a big city is you tend to have much more traffic. It tends to be more intimidating. There are more people and more places to go closer together, but on the other hand, the traffic is more intimidating in a big city. So there's sort of pluses and minuses. I think in rural areas, it's really difficult. Um, it depends on the rural area you're talking about. But I think that um, in general, at least I'm thinking of American rural areas, that things are so far apart and the nearest shopping center might be 10 miles away and then, and then they have now these consolidated school districts where the school is five miles away or 10 miles away, which makes it almost impossible for the kids to walk or bike to school. So I think in rural areas we have a, a big, big challenge. In fact, if you look at the National Travel Survey, I think it's like 99.9% .9 of trips, a huge percentage of trips in rural areas in the United States are made by car just because things are so far away. And then you mentioned that in um, the Yukon as well, you know, they have a high proportion of mode, mode share. What would your advice be to many winter communities within Canada um, who are looking to increase cycling? In My advice to which communities? Uh, those that have uh, a win winter communities oh. or, no, or the cities in winter time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What would, your, uh, well, what would your advice be? First of all, I can tell you, I didn't show it here, but I'm, when I gave the talk in Montreal and Quebec City, I did show it. <laughs> and that is compliments of Velo Quebec. They actually show it month by month, levels of cycling in Montreal or Quebec City. And there's no question, cycling goes down in January and February and then comes back up in March and April and so forth. So it, it's not that, how can I put it this? It's, it's not that the, the weather in, in, in any particular day doesn't make any difference. Having really, really cold weather, if it's 20 degrees below zero, not many people are going to be out there on bikes. Um, but in spite of that, Montreal, uh, Ottawa, Quebec City have flourishing bike cultures. Um, likewise, Minneapolis, I mean, the, the second most bike-oriented city in the United States has really, really, really cold winters. Um, I don't think there's that many people who get out there in January and February, but for the rest of the year, whenever they can, they're out there on bikes. I don't have any solution as to how you insulate yourself 
<laughs> against the winter. I mean, you can wear lots and lots of layers. There are people who do it, but I don't cycle when it's minus 20. <laughs> I just don't. So I, I don't really have a solution to it. But, but I guess the, the, the point I wanted to make is, is that being, having a cold climate, having cold winters, doesn't mean you can't have a cycling culture. And because clearly, those city, cities that I just point out have, have very, very cold winters, and yet very, uh, there's a, a one, one story I have to tell them. I, I know my answers go on forever, but that's okay. There's a city in the north of Norway, and I have a Czech friend who went, was at a mathematics conference in the northern part of Norway in the middle of winter. And he said it was like literally minus 20. And everyone was out there cycling. He couldn't believe it. So even there, I mean, I'm not sure what the, what the key to the making that possible was. It was a university, so maybe that was part of it. But it was just uh, incredible. <laughs> Go ahead. We have one question from Brent Totterin. He asks, uh, what's your opinion on BC's bike helmet law? And let's, let, let's, let's try to keep this short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, hmm. I will tell you what I think. I'll tell you my honest opinion. I am not in favor of compulsory bike helmet laws for adults. Um, <laughs> I really think that should be a personal choice. And I mean, I, in Europe, I never ever wear a helmet. In the United States, in New Jersey, I do. Um, because actually one of my neighbors uh, um, kept yelling at me every time I didn't wear a helmet and said, I'm a bad example for her kids. <laughs> I said, okay, I wear, I'll wear a helmet. But I, I, I'm just really against compulsory helmet laws. I mean, if, I think an adult, uh, can make that decision, and it really ought to be up to the individual. I'm not so sure about kids. I don't think you can really um, expect a kid to know, well, should I wear a helmet or not? I can tell you it's a very controversial topic. And the reason it's controversial is, in fact, we have this, a safety chapter in the book written by two public health uh, professionals. And what they found is that the health benefits of people, of the additional people cycling because of not having a compulsory helmet law, far, far, far offset whatever additional injuries that are incurred because people aren't wearing the helmets. So, there, but I can tell you in the public health profession, it's one of the most controversial topics that's around. Uh, but I'll also tell you that in those countries with very high levels of cycling, None of them that I'm aware of has a, a bike helmet, a compulsory bike, bike helmet law for adults. In addition to which, I mentioned the issue of bike sharing. Good luck starting a bike sharing program with a bike helmet law. It's very difficult because they tried it in Brisbane and in Melbourne and they really had trouble. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Could, yes, I have a question uh, for those gray haired members. Um, what, what comment do you, what, what do you think of the electric assist bikes in terms of helping 65 plus to get on their bikes? Interesting you should ask. <laughs> because I was riding one this afternoon. <laughs> Compliments of the city of Vancouver. Um, first of all, I must tell you, it was really neat. I actually, I mean, I, I did not use the electric assist uh, on the flat, uh, but I was going up from... Anyway, wherever the water was, I'm not sure what body. We have so many bodies of water on here, I'm not sure what's what. <laughs> but anyway, from uh, going up Hornby Street. Uh, and it was, it was a convenient assist. It really, really was. And I mean, I'm getting older and older. That means I have a little bit less energy than I did maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And I found it really convenient. And you can still pedal at the same time. And you're not going 1,000 miles an hour. It's not like it's, it's going to propel you, you know, at tremendous speeds. I think it's actually a good idea. And, and you know what? I have a confession to make. I didn't think it was a good idea until I rode this bike. <laughs> and because I was thinking, oh, no, 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 no. You've got, you got to get the full physical activity of going <laughs> up those hills. You're getting that real good cardiovascular exercise. But I'm thinking there are many people uh, who are really deterred when they're in a hilly sort of topography, and, and you have some hills here, and there's hills in Portland, and there's hills in Seattle, and so forth, and I'm thinking, you know, as, as you're getting, as I'm getting older, I find that, you know, it's, it's a useful convenience. It really, I thought you, it was you really only have to look. You only have to look across the water here at the North Shore. That's where I live. I wouldn't be riding if I didn't have electric assist. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was great. And it's actually not, um, I, um, uh, I think, um, 
Peter Starry was the one who gave it to me, and he said it's sort of a clunky bike. I didn't find it was that clunky. I mean, it was my, my regular bike is at least as heavy. I mean, I have suspension on it and so forth and so on, but my regular bike is actually as heavy as this electric assist bike, so it's not as if it's all that heavy. And I just thought it was really convenient. And it, it's something that I learned today. I mean, so I see, I learned a lot of things too. I learned as much from you and from my trips around as anyone else. I think it's actually a really good idea. But I'm against, by the way, one thing I am against, I'm against bikes that go really fast. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, I mean, 30 whatever miles an hour. I mean, there are bikes that will go that fast, so I think there ought to be a limit in terms of how fast they will go. But I think in general, I'm, uh, especially having experienced it today, I'm really in favor of them. Hi, I wanted to thank you very much for your, is it not working? Okay, thank you very much for the lively, uh, informative conversation. And I was just thinking about the timing because I was at the city council meeting a couple days ago that was referred to, and it's such a celebration here of the great work that our city is doing um, compared to some of the, the comments that we were getting at the council meeting from business, as you mentioned, and surprisingly to me from a number of residents who were opposed to traffic calming, go figure. So anyway, it's wonderful to, to see that kind of celebration. And you mentioned the point about the significance of um, communicating to the public and, and so on. And I think that is really critical. And I'm wondering if you have any great examples to share of ways that you feel have been particularly effective to communicate some of these messages to the public. I can tell you one thing, don't do it with equations. <laughs> I mean, the public and politicians couldn't care less about fancy models, fancy statistics, things that are confusing. Make it as simple as possible, as convincing as possible. If you can do it, show it graphically, as opposed to just in numbers. And uh, I mean, that's just sort of in terms of providing that evidence. The other thing I wanted to mention, just in terms of countering these, the opposition to say, the business opposition to, to putting in, say, bike corrals, or putting in a cycle track, or um, resident, residents who object to the traffic calming, and to already have the answers and ask, well, don't you know that that's going to improve traffic safety by 60 to 80 percent? Don't you know that's going to actually increase retail sales? And here's the evidence. Cities A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I think it's really important to have that sort of evidence ready at hand to counter this sort of I think absurd argument. I think it's misinformation on their part or a misconception on their part. They're imagining they're going to lose business when in fact it will be good for business. I'm not sure if you folks are aware of it, but when they created in Europe these car-free zones, they sort of started out small and there was huge opposition, huge opposition from many of the merchants. Oh, if people can't get to us by car, we're going to go out of business. Well, it turns out when they created the car-free zones, the businesses boomed. And the businesses that were on the outskirts demanded to be made part of the car-free zone as well, till the car-free zones got bigger and bigger and bigger. And Jan Gale, in his video about Copenhagen, said, now the very business people who had opposed the traffic calming claim it was their idea in the first place. <laughs> but I think having, this is why you have to sort of be prepared with information. I'm, I'm the consultant on the CDC's uh, biannual benchmarking report, uh, which is for walking, walking and cycling in the United States. It's financed by the CDC, so it's only the United States. I'm sorry, we don't include Canada. Um, but it's cha we, have, we included a full chapter on the economic benefits of walking and cycling investments and a full chapter on the health benefits of walking and cycling, obviously, because we're doing it for CDC. But we, what we found is these days, one of the most, con most important things is convincing politicians and businesses that it's also good for business. And I mean, I don't know how we just comb the entire literature. We're updating it out of 2014. In fact, we have a first draft report due in two weeks. Um, and that sort of information, having that at your fingertips is really useful in these sorts of meetings. When someone gets up and says, oh, don't you know that's going to ruin our business? But, but you know, in cities A, B, C, D, and G, there was a 70-something percent increase in retail sales. Well, how, how, how is it going to ruin your business? Uh, so I think being, in for, being armed, I'm not sure if that's the right word, being in Formed, having the information to defend a pro-bike, pro-walk point of view is really, really important. And to present it simply, convincingly as possible. Uh, well, one from the front and then one from Twitter and then one from the back. Okay, there's lots of anecdotes about why kids no longer 
walk or bike to school like I did when I was a kid. But, and you know, and there are all the wonderful stories about the kid who gets driven across the street, the other kid who gets driven one block uh, to school. But what are the data? What studies show what, what is actually going through kids or, or parents' minds uh, that has them engaging in this behavior? Um, there's uh, three considerations. That it, why they don't, okay. Um, number one, there is, um, I mean, it's in a way legitimate but exaggerated fear of stranger danger. At least in the United States, in American cities, there's a fear if kids are going to school by themselves, they could be abducted, something could happen to them, someone could sell drugs to them. There's a real fear, this is a sort of stranger dangerous one. Second is the traffic danger, that the parents feel uncomfortable having their kids walking or cycling to school by themselves because of the, the danger. Number three, and this is a, a big problem in the United States, and that's the super consolidation of school districts. And so they're closing smaller schools and having bigger and bigger regional schools so that the trip distances are getting farther. This is true not everywhere, but uh, it is true in some cases. What exactly is going through parents' heads, I'm not sure, but the, I think part of it is the fault of the media. You know, one kid, it's a tragic, tragic uh, thing when it happens, but one kid gets abducted or gets killed in a, in a traffic uh, uh, crash on the way to school, and it makes the headline of the newspaper. And it gets really, it's, it's tragic, it's something we want to avoid completely, but it gets blown so much out of proportion that it totally offsets the mar much more important consideration of you're robbing your kid of that physical activity of of that independence of navigating on your own and so forth and so on. So, I mean, I think, I can't tell you exactly what's going through parents' heads, but I think the media have really been guilty of playing up in headlines every time something happens to a kid who does bike or, or walk to school so that parents are now terrified in the United States of letting their kids bike or walk to school. Great. Thank you. Sure. We're close to nine o'clock, so we're just going to take three more questions from the floor and two questions from the Twitter world here. Um, Darren Marr asks, John, how do you address resistance to cycling initiatives from those who complain about the cost? Um, my response is all of the economic studies, and there have been a lot, uh, dozens if not hundreds show that the economic benefits of cycling um, exceed by a ratio of five, six, seven to one the costs. Uh, I'm not sure, oh, I forgot to point that out actually in one of those Sydney slides. They looked at the cycle tracks in Sydney and they actually had an independent consulting firm come in and do an estimate uh, of what were the benefits of that cycle track, the economic benefits, and what were the costs of building the cycle track and maintaining the cycle tracks, and it was three to one in that particular case. The benefits, the economic benefits, three to one in terms of the cost. Every project is different. So I mean, you can't generalize and say it's gonna be that ratio all the time. But in, in almost all the cases I've looked at, the benefits exceed the costs. And the, the key thing is what, and that's just in benefits you can measure. What about you know, those, it's very difficult to measure some of these how do you measure mental health benefits or social health benefits uh, or even physical health benefits? It's really, really difficult. What's the value of human life? How do you compare uh, the, the making someone healthier in terms of dollars and cents to the dollars and cents you can calculate in terms of building a cycle track? It's very, very difficult to do that. But I can, all, all I can say is an increasing number of studies have tried to do that. And they have come up with estimates. And for example, there was a Danish study. It was the Danish Ministry of Transport. And they found that for every, I guess it's a Danish crown, for every Danish crown they invested in their cycling infrastructure, that they saved more than three Danish crowns in reduced health care costs. That's just in terms of the economic cost of health care. That's three to one. Add on whatever other benefits there are to cycling uh, on top of that. So it's at least three to one. And there, anyway, there's dozens of those studies. Sure. Um, we've got a situation here that we haven't experienced before, which is our provincial government um, is going to be, or has announced that they're going to uh, have a referendum 
so that trans so we can get uh, funding for TransLink for transit and also for cycling uh, infrastructure in the region. And in your one of your recommendations is that people who want to work with on cycling and um, uh, walking work with transit advocates. Do you have any experience from the U.S. where, uh, particularly where these referendum campaigns have helped to build a movement for sustainable transportation and has actually been uh, been used as an opportunity to build something stronger? Yeah, I mean, at least in the United States, uh, the American Public Transportation Association certainly works uh, with the League of American Bicyclists and the Alliance for Biking and, and Walking, and it really is seen, it's this, this package of sustainable transportation modes, walking, cycling, and public transportation, and I think the reason is, if you look at how do people get to transit stops, uh, in the United States, 90% get there by walking, and then another 2%, 3% get there by bike, and the rest get there by car. And so, the, again, the, as I mentioned before, transit systems view walking and cycling as an absolutely essential way, in a much cheaper way, to get to a transit stop, whether it's a rail stop or a bus stop, than it, would, than it is if you have to build extensive park and ride lots. And so, um, uh, there, there is, I'm, I'm not going to say that the public transit agencies are the key to the, the walking and, and, and sort of biking movement in the United States. I can tell you um, that probably public health professionals have been the biggest supporters. But public transit also sees the benefits. And this is why you see public transit, at least throughout the United States, I mean, uh, something like 80% now of all buses have bike racks. Uh, you're having improved bike parking at virtually all the rail stations uh, that you see in commuter rail lines around the United States. So I, I think it's in recognition of these transit systems that in fact bicycling can be good. And you, and you have to, it's not just a matter of, of building bike parking, but also having routes that lead, or bike routes that lead to these various transit stations. And as I was actually out there, in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> way out there at TransLink, um, I was thinking to myself, wow, look at all this you know, dense development. That's like perfect. They just got to you know, build those bikeways so they lead to these various SkyTrain stations. And the reason it's crucial is there's no way, I mean, in most cases, that you're going to be able to make all your trips by walking and cycling. There will be trips too long, and you're going to need transit. And so this is why for the longer trip, use transit. And for the shorter trip, you walk or you bike, or you can use the walk or the walking and the biking also to get to the transit station. So it should be a strong partnership. I mean, I don't know of a public transit official in the United States who's out and out against walking and cycling. They're not going to at least confess it. <laughs> uh, maybe they are, but they're not. But there, there's, I think, it hasn't been the key to promoting walking and cycling. I think right now, at least in the United States, the key backer of walking and cycling, and this might actually stun some of you, it's really the public health profession, by far. I mean, more than environmentalists, I mean, there is a huge, huge public health community out there that is doing everything they possibly can to promote walking and cycling. And something that might also stun you is some of the research shows that cycling produces more valuable cardiovascular benefits than walking. Depends on the speed, the conditions, and so forth. And I'm certainly not against walking at all. They're both extremely important modes. But I was sort of surprised. I thought, well, I thought cycling was sort of a, a lazy way to get around. <laughs> you know, it's less friction, and you don't need as much uh, energy. But for some reason, they, the studies they've done that when people are cycling, they somehow are getting better cardiovascular exercise. So anyway, that doesn't quite answer your question, but I never quite can. <laughs> Yes. Okay. okay. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights. I'm actually come from China, so I feel so privileged to raise a question. Uh, so uh, China is co co a different country with uh, high uh, population density. So uh, in my city, like uh, have a three million population, which is a medium-sized city in China. So uh, uh, we never found that the share by system. Uh, enough because from the starting point like, like where I live so I every time I get up I just feel no find no bikes <laughs> so, and then uh, from the destination point uh, there are never enough uh, uh, parking stations so uh, how would you uh, measure that uh, uh, what could be enough uh, for investment in 
shared by system. And then uh, are there any similar uh, just high density, uh, high population density cities that we can learn from? Any models or any uh, statistics that, that we can just learn from? Thank you. Manhattan's a pretty high population density place. <laughs> and we'll have to wait and see how that works with the city bike. Uh, the, the problem, uh, and by the way, the most successful or the, the biggest bike sharing program is in China. It's in Hangzhou. I think it's over 70,000 bikes now. Or is it, uh, it's in South, uh, is that the white city? Well, anyway, it's the biggest bike sharing city in the, in the whole world. It's like 70 or 80,000 bikes. And it's been um, successful and it's popular if you can find the bike, <laughs> I should say. That it's, it's very, very, very popular. It, it, um, uh, the, the bigger problem with bike sharing is uh, an imbalance in the direction uh, that people want to use the bikes. Often it's going in one direction in the morning rush hour and in another direction in the afternoon rush hour. And so you have um, too many bikes um, in the center of the city <laughs> when you don't want those bikes. You want them out in the outskirts. And so they end up, I mean, I've seen these trucks actually in Montreal, in fact, constantly going back and forth, reshuffling where the bikes are. And I, just, I do have to say, I have to wonder myself, how environmentally friendly is that, um, having trucks transferring these bikes back and forth? It's a consideration. And, but I think in almost every bike sharing system I'm aware of, there is this imbalance. Part of it's due to topography. It turns out people prefer cycling downhill Hill to cycling uphill. <laughs> and so in Barcelona, in fact, there's always a surplus of bikes at the bottom of the hill and not nearly enough bikes at the top of the hill. So they're constantly taking trucks and taking the bikes to the top of the hill. But I can tell you that there are benefits to the bike sharing in that it's been a real boost. It's really interested more people in biking. Every city where bike sharing, put it in the Western world, where bike sharing in North America, Europe, uh, South America, where bike sharing has been introduced, it has tremendously increased levels of cycling. Um, but I think it's a legitimate question, what happens if it's so popular <laughs> that there's just not enough bikes? Do you really, I mean, it, currently, the, I think they've already signed up, it was over 100,000, I think, uh, annual subscribers to the New York City system. What happens if 8 million people subscribe to it? <laughs> I mean, how do you provide that many bikes? Um, but if you look at, say, the Netherlands or, or Denmark, I mean, the, they actually started the bike sharing in, in sort of the, called the first or the second generation of bike sharing. But, you know, most of the Dutch and the Danes and the Germans have their own bikes. And some of them have two or three bikes, and they'll have it at both of the, the say, they're taking a transit trip. And then they'll have a bike at one end and at the other end of the transit trip. And so Germany doesn't really have that much bike sharing. So... I don't know, I think in a culture that has a lot of bikes, where everyone already has their own bikes, that bike sharing might not be quite as crucial, but in a city where you're trying to promote cycling, for example, in Paris, where you started out with a bike mode share of 1%, and you managed to increase it to 2 and a half, 3%, that there wasn't such a, a, a enormous demand that there weren't enough bikes. I mean, it's been very popular. I think having bike sharing in a city where, say, 40% of people are biking <laughs> might be a little bit more difficult. Now, what the Dutch do, by the way, and that, that's an example. It's not quite bike sharing now, but it's called uh, um, public transit bikes. It's O V feet, which means bike in, in Dutch. And what they do is they have a transit car that also that integrates bicycling and, and mass transit. But it, it's a, a special card, and if you have a monthly pass for transit, you then can very easily and cheaply rent the bike which is available at virtually every train station in the Netherlands. And so instead of having the kind of a bike sharing system that they're introducing, that you have in Montreal, or that they're introducing in New York, you have a very deeply discounted bike um, loaning system, uh, which seems to work very, very well in the Netherlands, because I've used it. <laughs> One question here from Twitter. Chris Kim asks, um, how do you, how do you convince teens to uh, ride a bike? What kind of campaigns are there out there? Ooh. They, uh, go to, say, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, or Williamsburg, uh, uh, and you'll see it's like the in thing to do. And not riding a bike is really, like, out. <laughs> It's, be it's become actually part of the culture, sort of this hipster culture. You are in if you're riding a bike, 
and especially if it's a fixie, <laughs> and you're out. I mean, you do not want to be seen driving a car. And so I think that there's sort of an interesting sort of how the image of cycling changes over time. It used to be that, you know, you have to have a car to impress your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whatever. And these days, you know, maybe having a really neat bike <laughs> is the way to attract uh, a partner. <laughs> I mean, you never know. <laughs> Hi, Tanya Paz. I want to ask you about two things, traffic calming and the word pleasant. So uh, traffic calming, it seems to me in Vancouver, if we're just uh, in a few spaces making it a traffic calming, then you end up increasing the traffic on the streets next to it and the arterials next to that, so that some of your neighborhood uh, greenways are actually increasing in traffic. And so how do you do it across the board, or in what method do you, is it works out well, or does it just take four decades? And then, because it's Friday night, and uh, also the encouraging women to cycle, the whole pleasant thing, I, not to pit engineers against planners, but... Some of them may not have the same pretty outlook. I mean, some of your uh, great photos from Vancouver, uh, romantic photos of cycling come from a planner, not an engineer here. So, you know, how do you... <laughs> uh, how, what are great examples to make it look pleasant as well? All right. Okay. So. Uh, let me answer the first question first, <laughs> and that is... Um, it, that just selectively traffic calming, say, just one street, and not doing it with parallel streets can really be a problem, just what you've said. This is why in European cities, traffic calming is comprehensive. It's really the whole residential area. And what they do is they deliberately then try to divert the major traffic to arterials that are meant to handle through traffic. And but the, the, So it's not just one street. Now, what I would be in favor of is comprehensively traffic calming. I mean, as I say, Freiburg already has this like 90% of their streets are traffic calmed, and, and even a higher percentage of the residential streets. In Berlin, that was 72% of all streets, and it's probably like 85% you know, of residential streets. And that's 30 kilometers or less. And then I would say within that network of comprehensively traffic calm neighborhoods, then introduce you know, whatever you want to call it, bike boulevards or local street bikeways, say, OK, within this context, of a comprehensively traffic calmed residential area, we're going to facilitate cycling along this particular route by having perpendicular stop signs and so forth and so on. So uh, I agree with your point that just, because it happens also in the town where I live in New Jersey, normally, Highland Park, the, the, what they've done is they put speed humps on one or two avenues, and what's happened is the traffic just goes to the other avenues. And that doesn't really accomplish the, main, the purpose that you're... So I think it ought to be comprehensive. That's, and the same thing with the, uh, the issue of car-free zones. Uh, it's not just one street that's car-free in these European cities. It's an entire... Comp it's an integrated network of streets that's car-free, and that's what makes it work. Uh, the second question of pleasantness. Um, <laughs> I think aesthetics and urban design... I'm not a urban designer, but what I find is when there's a really interesting environment, I want to slow down and experience it. I enjoy it. I don't want to rush through it. And I think that urban design, even though I'm not an architect or urban designer, is absolutely crucial in getting people to walk and cycle. And if you, when I'm walking through a really interesting urban neighborhood, there's restaurants, there's bars or whatever, lots of interesting things to look at, sculptures, something, lots of looking at other people. Uh, that's, to me, I, the time just go by so fast. It's like, it's one of those moments that you experience as infinity, where you're really sort of focusing on the moment because it's so pleasant for me. I'm not sure if pleasant's the right word that I should be using, but I, I find it an aesthetically pleasing experience that I really enjoy it. I'm getting a benefit out of it in addition to getting from point A to point B. In addition to getting physical activity, I am actually enjoying the moment of just being there and, and seeing whatever I'm experiencing. Um, and it can be a matter of the, the, the I, I'm trying to think of where we saw this. Um, but anyway, you can make the pavement interesting. You can put in interesting shrubbery and, and encourage a lot of sort of storefront activity. So you have a lot of things to look at as you're walking or as you're cycling. Uh, because if you make it a dull, uh, kind of an environment, people are just going to want 
whiz right through it. And in fact, there's a, a, a book by, I can't remember his name now, it's called it's Mental Speed Bumps. And he says, the more interesting you make an environment, the slower people will go through it. So that's why he calls them mental speed bumps. Make things interesting, make, by using urban design in the right way, people will slow down. They won't want to be rushing through it. So I guess that's what I think of as pleasantness. <laughs> I like that mental speed bumps. I'll have to remember that one. Um, well, that concludes our evening tonight. Uh, everybody who is, uh, I guess, an infrastructure nerd or wants to share the joy of all the awesome data and research that John and. Or who wants to read that racy chapter on this chapter? <laughs> I don't know. John, are you selling these books here? Uh, I'm not selling them. But I okay. have some to give away to. All right. Hub, so but Hub, we're trying to. Uh, I'm donating five copies to Hub to encourage membership uh, in Hub Love. Uh, so check out Hub to grab a copy of this book. And I just wanted to thank, on behalf of uh, SFU Continuing Studies City Program, we'd like to thank um, Urban Systems, TransLink, and the City of Vancouver for helping to bring you out here. And thank you so much for this lovely evening. And you should know that uh, you were, uh, SFU Cycle was trending on Twitter in Vancouver this evening. Oh. So my question was, do you have a Twitter handle? I am so cyber challenged, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I can email, but I've never tweeted in my life. <laughs> I really have never tweeted. I've been told that people tweet about me, but I've never tweeted in my life. <laughs> well, the next time you come out here, maybe we'll have you on Twitter. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. And one last word, don't give up the fight, really. I mean, you have to keep going, keep going, keep trying, get together with other people. I mean, just don't give up. It's not, I mean, I was talking to someone and she was telling me they had tried twice, three times, four times to get something built. The fifth time they got it built. So don't give up the first or the second or the third time when it's turned down. Keep on trying. And it really, the, and the more of you who do it, the better. So. Thank you.